Good morning, good evening, or good day, wherever you are in the world.、Uh, it is lovely to have you here. Thank you for taking the time to come and、uh, join me for this presentation about Kani Diem and what we have done this year in 2022. First up, who am I? My name is William Brown. I'm a senior software engineer here at Suza Labs, and my speciality. Uh, is in authentication and identity management services. So I'm responsible for a lot of our LDAP and identity、um, offerings,、uh, and I'm also the、uh, creator of the CunyDM project uh, and the uh, WebAuthn library for Rust, as well as participating in the WebAuthn workgroup. I'm based in Queensland, Australia. Uh, which means that my UTC,、uh, my time zone is UTC plus ten. So if you don't often see me around, that's why.、Uh, so if you have any questions at the end of this talk. Please send me an email, which is at wbrown@suza.de. So, first, if you haven't been to one of these talks before, what is CunyDM? It is a new piece of software for identity management, which is that it acts as a、uh, system which grants、uh, identities and authority over、um, who people are on a computer system or a network. So you can have many Linux machines or websites. Trust CunyDM to make those authorization and authentication decisions for you. We've had this for a long time in open source through other things like LDAP and Kerberos,、um, but CunyDM、um, breaks from some of these by trying to focus on some different goals, like being extremely simple to deploy,、uh, focusing on extremely high reliability, and being correct and secure by default. Now, we, I've spoken about this project a number of times、uh, at Suza Labs, and it's kind of become a tradition at this point to give a, an update on the state of the project at the Suza Labs conference,、um, which is also a little bit special because, you know, Suza Labs was the place where it was first announced,、um, and so you know, I, I'm, I really enjoy being able to give these updates to everyone. And I think that 2022 has definitely been our most successful year yet.、Uh, we've had more than 350 commits from 19 different unique contributors to the project,、um, and we now have more than 1,200 stars on GitHub, making it the most highest-rated project for identity management within open source, even over FreeRPA, OpenLDAP 3.8.9, and Samba, which to me is just such a, a massive endorsement of the project. And our community and our user bases have have grown significantly. We have people around the world now running this,、um, and I think there's there's even some larger deployments out there as well as people starting to grow. And of course, this year, you know, we've seen a, a huge amount of development in the project as well, and and we have a lot of new and improved features. You know, our support for Open OAuth two and Open ID Connect has greatly improved. We have proper user onboarding、um, and improvements to workflows that are required for you know bringing in new staff or or new students or, or just new users. We support、um, pass keys, and we have made a lot of improvements in the WebAuthn space,、uh, and especially with CTAP two support on the command line. We've started implementing foundations for replication.、Uh, we've now got a Python three API and a large number of performance improvements, and I think.、Um, Thinking about the the kind of improvements that we're seeing is that we're not seeing big fundamental changes to the lower level parts of the code now. We're starting to see a lot of feature components and、um, a lot of polish, and it's really exciting as the project is starting to become a lot more production ready and starting to you know meet some of those requirements for for people in those environments. So let's go through some of the things that we've done this year. Now the first one we've done is is improvements to performance. Um, Crab's got to go fast, man. So something like CunyDM,、uh, it, it is itself in a way a database, and it has a different structure to something like SQL. Something like CunyDM or 389 or Active Directory, these tend to have high numbers of read workloads compared to something like SQL, which has to deal with a large amount of read-write workloads and a lot more complexity there. The other thing is that Workloads in an identity management system tend to have a smaller data set size, whereas something like Postgres may have, you know, hundreds of gigabytes to terabytes. CunyDM, you know, can store a hundred thousand users with ten thousand groups in three hundred and fifty megabytes. Because of this smaller data set、um, and the very small high frequency of reads, we have a lot of very small transactions rather than a lot of long-lived transactions, which again is a contrast to SQL. 
And of course, because of these differences, we can actually take advantage of a lot of improvements uh, and a lot of very uh, focused optimizations that SQL cannot itself um, uh, generally uh, implement due to their, their very different workloads and structures. This year alone, Cunningham has actually doubled in performance, which is fantastic to see. That is a massive increase. And this has come from lots of different sources over the code base, but there are two major changes that really stand out. The first one is that we completely rewrote the entry internals. We have strongly typed internals to um, database entries using a NoSQL style key value store, um, which can have rich and complex types contrast to something like LDAP, which is effectively just um, key value where every value is always a, a string. So previously we had a map of keys and then that stored a map of values. And of course, each of these values had to individually strongly typed and was an enumeration. But as we grew, that enumeration grew larger and larger. And so it became harder um, to grow that and it became more complicated and, and slower to look up because it's more like a case switch statement. So we rewrote this so that um, now we have keys tied to um, fat pointer objects or in Rust parlance, DIN traits. This is what you would see in C++ with something like a trait. Uh, not a trait object, sorry, a, a V table or an object where you've got a virtual fat pointer that um, points to a, a sort of dis dynamic dispatch. Um, and each of these implementers of the value set trait can then themselves, you know, have the methods that are required. And of course, this also allows um, unique storage types for each of the different key components and types that exist within them. So we can have, say, a, uh, a hash set for things that are often looked up but not iterated over, whereas we can have a, a B tree set for something that might be iterated over where it's less efficient over a hash map. So this has been one of the major improvements here. The other improvement um, came from work that happened with uh, the, uh, a student from uh, Prague and the uh, mentoring program that we have here at SUSE for mentoring university students in Prague. Um, and he undertook a project to help with benchmarking and um, some of the data structures that we use as we've invented some new data structures that are used within Cunning. And he pointed out that, you know, that there were some improvements we could have. So we rely very heavily on um, copy on write data structures. So the way that we um, look up something in a B plus tree is that you'll, you'll um, be looking to, to follow a set of pointers down that tree. So if we're looking up a value, let's say we're looking at the value 25, first we'll compare to number 10, which is greater than, so we'll compare to 20, it's greater than, we compare to 30 and it's less than, and we've now found our pointer, which is here, so that we can then begin the dereferencing process. So we've had to do three comparisons, then the dereference. We had implemented SIMD for this, which allowed us to do parallel lookups of these keys. So we could do it in um, uh, fewer instructions, but of course we still had to set up the query so that we could actually do the, um, the correct lookup within these structures. And that was a very good improvement already. But he noted that because of some of the ways that we use our hash maps, um, we could actually use a hash tree instead. And instead of storing metadata in the, um, uh, the, the excess bytes of the, the node, we could actually store them in the pointers. So now what we do is we, we take a, a, a value that we want to look up and we hash it. And given that value in binary, we can take the last three bits and then use that as an offset into the array at some level of the tree. And as we follow that pointer, we can then look at the next three bits. And of course that shows us where we need to look in the next node of the tree. So the cost of this is that we can't easily free tree branches once we create something because it is a very shallow but broad tree. And even if, you know, there's a very small chain of nodes descending, it's quite complicated um, and tedious to actually do cleanup and compaction. Um, and, but this isn't really such a big deal because um, we maximum, if we had a tree that supported 16 million entries, it only takes 16 kilobytes worth of nodes to actually populate that map. Um, and so this is a very small amount of memory um, to have access to, to a much faster lookup. 
Um, even compared to the simmed lookup, this is significant. This is a significant improvement. So these two changes with the entry rewrite and the improved data structures, uh, which we use heavily in our caching for application level caching, um, have really improved the performance of Kani um, this year, which is um, really fantastic to see. The next major thing that we've been doing is foundations for replication. And replication is really important for us because it's what gives us high availability between multiple nodes. But of course, in any distributed system, we're bound by CAP theorem. CAP theorem denotes that there are three possible properties that you can choose from. Consistency, which is that every um, client which makes a read from your network service gets always the most recent write that could have occurred between any set of nodes in the topology. Availability is that every read will always get a response, but without the guarantee of it being up to date. And partition tolerance, which is that the system can operate even if network failures exist. So most people, when we're deploying a system, we always want partition tolerance. So the choice becomes, do we want consistency or availability? Now, consistency and partition uh, tolerance look really attractive. Um, you know, we get a fully consistent uh, data set and we can handle network failures. But it comes at a cost. That consistency takes a lot of effort to actually build. So some systems have this, um, such as Etsy, uh, etcd, uh, which is a uh, partition tolerant and consistent database. However, the, the limitation here is its write throughput and read performance, which is not as uh, high as other systems. So for a system with really high performance needs where when it comes to reads and writes, partition tolerance and availability is really the only choice. And this is, or, this is not unknown. This has already been proven in many other database systems and, and projects, um, including 389DS, which I have a lot of experience in, Active Directory, Samba 4, MongoDB, and many others. So partition tolerance and availability is the way that we want to go in, in Cunny DM because you know, nothing else really can act as a uh, partition tolerant and available database for us in the way that we need. So the way that we've started to implement this is um, a replication system. This, sorry, the, the way we've started to implement this replication system is based on change logs. And this is heavily inspired by the work in 389 directory server, um, which honestly actually has a really good system for doing replication. And the way that this works is that we have change logs that are sent and merged. And the idea is that when um, replayed, all the nodes will arrive at the same state. And this is, uh, gives a strong eventual consistency. So imagine we have server A and B here. We make a change on server A. At some point in time, eventually or later, server A will replicate its change log to server B. And it now has a copy of that change, which is, you know, and so both servers can now ensure that it applies to their entries. But what happens if both servers receive a change at the same time? What happens then? So we have a change number two appear on server A and change number three on server B. And we order these by both time with a Lamport clock, which is an always advancing clock. It can never go backwards. It has to go forwards. And we also use server IDs to help tie break. So each of these changes with these numbers, these would actually be a more complex structure to help tie break. But what happens when we send these change logs to each other, because the order of change application matters, is that we send change three from server B to A. And so server A now has the full content. And in reverse, server A would send change two to server B. So it now has the full set of changes. Server B would rearrange the order of change two and three to make sure that they are ordered with respect to time. And now, as we can see that both servers have the full set of changes, they can rewind and replay those change logs and they'll both arrive at the same state. So they'll both end up with the same um, entries in the end. So this is how we end up with a replicated system here. So what about user onboarding? Again, I've, I mentioned this as well. And user onboarding was something else that we've done this year with Cunny. And, oh, sorry, I should have mentioned with this. Um, we've implemented the foundations for the change logs. We haven't implemented the full system yet. So we now have the ability to record change entries and replay them, inject them, and assert you know, that the changes are applied in a specific order and then reject changes that don't apply. 
we are still working on actually adding in the second server so that we can do this. But we want to be really careful about adding that because, you know, I believe that the project should should meet the highest of quality. Um, and so we want to be very careful about modeling this and testing this. So sorry for that. User onboarding. So with our onboarding, you know, I think the question here is that often people ask is, you know, well, maybe not that people ask, is that I sat down and asked myself, well, what's the difference between we have a new user who needs to be onboarded, someone who's lost their credentials and need them reset, and someone who needs to do self-service of their credentials and update them. And I sat down and, and asked this and thought about it, and I realized that all of these are actually the same problem. So provided that we do one of them, we actually end up with all of them. So the way that we handled user onboarding was through the issuance of a token. Um, and that token is cryptographically secure and, you know, hand, and is replay attack prevented. So you can't replay and use the token more than once. You can only exchange the token one time. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff. And this even, the design even accounts for replication and replication delay within that design um, and, and to how we issue that and manage that token internally. And so as a result, when we have a lost credential reset, all we do is the same process. We just reset that token and give it to the user. And internally, when a user is doing a self-service update, they're effectively just issuing themselves a reset token internally and then immediately following it. So all of these ended up being the same workflow. And we've already started to use this with you know, real people outside of engineering, outside of technical users, um, and asking them to follow this process. And they've had a really positive uh, set of feedback for us. The big change as well um, around web authentic pass keys is that um, this year, uh, as someone who follows the web authentic work group quite closely and you know seeing how these things have adapted and changed, um, it may kind of come as a surprise, but actually in this year, you know, what we previously thought of as you know, these second factors, these tokens that would you know, accompany a password, there have actually been a number of changes in the FIDO specification, which didn't which um, uh, is the specification governing um, YubiKeys and how they interact with browsers. But the specification uh, for WebAuthn, which is how your browser communicates with a server, these two specifications have both had some changes, which interestingly makes them kind of no longer suitable for use as a second factor. Probably a surprise. But these changes are because these devices are now intended to work in a different way. They are intended to be a self-contained multi-factor authenticator. You may personally have actually witnessed or interacted with and seen this change yourself. Um, you may, you know, when logging into our corporate Okta portal, have noticed that when you plug in your key, you'll be prompted for a pin. Well, it turns out that it doesn't, that Okta itself isn't actually using the pin. It's never actually verifying that you used the correct pin, or sorry, or that the pin was entered correctly. You can in fact disable this prompt. There's a way to do so. But this is what I mean by the specification for Fight on Web Authent has changed. They are pushing that you enter your pin and do a self-contained multi-factor authentication. But a lot of sites that are using Web Authent as a second factor are now suddenly seeing people, you know, have to enter their pin but weren't really kind of ready for it. Um, and so as a result, um, you know, the goal is going to be that you shouldn't need a password at all. It should just be touch your key, enter the pin, which is stored locally and verified locally within your device. And then that does the cryptographic signature. So there should be no password processing on the authentication server whatsoever. And this is really important because having these as self-contained multi-factor authenticators is significantly better than the current state that we have with passwords and TOTP. So the pin never leaves the device. You can also have biometrics on the device. So there's the YubiKey 5, uh, 5C Bio, which has a fingerprint reader built into the device. So your fingerprint ne never leaves the device. These are stored in secure enclaves. Um, they are resistant to brute force. You can't actually you know, just extract the pin out of, of that. Um, they're tamper-proof, so you can't just break it and grab the, um, the private keys out. Um, and of course, you know, these require physical presence. So let's say that in the worst case, you know, someone backdoors a, a machine here at Sousa, um, you know, someone who had that cannot force your 
YubiKey attached to the machine to release a signature. Only you, the holder of that key, can actually do so. And so it means that you know, remote attacks are much harder to actually pull off. Um, and it, you know, it even means that in the case of you know, a uh, authentication service being compromised, they no longer have password hashes, they've just got public keys. And so as a result, they, they gain nothing about you as a person, um, which is fantastic. So because of this, um, you know, we really want this in uh, CunyDM. Um, so we've actually made some sig really significant changes to WebAuthn, uh, the WebAuthn library for Rust around this. Um, and, you know, really massive thanks to Martin Searinghouse for their work on the client side of this. Um, they've written the CTAP2 support for Firefox, and then we use that within CunyDM. And of course, now our UI elements actually deprioritize TOTP and passwords. Um, and WebAuthn as a second factor is no longer possible to enroll. If you had one before, it'll still work, but you can't add it anymore. You, you can only remove them. In the future, we'll also add some um, policy around which authenticators can actually be used. The final thing is, you know, we have really improved our OAuth2 and OIDC handling, and this is really important. Um, because you know it's all well and good to have an authentication system, but we need applications to integrate with that. And OAuth and OIDC really is the the, the most popular um, and direction that a lot of online services are going with. And you know this is really important that applications or web applications can delegate to something like CunyDM because authentication is really not simple. You know authentication is in the same vein as cryptography. Don't do it unless you are an authentication expert. There are so many ways that you can mess this up. So, you know, our support of OIDC and OAuth is really good because it means that you, the application developer, can, you know, think a bit less about which, you know, pass keys you need to use or password hashing items or whatever, and you can delegate that off to something like OIDC. We also have really improved some of our workflows in, with regard to things like choice and consent over personal data and notifying you when those things change, um, which is really good for you, the user, because you can actually then see, oh, you know, this integration is now seeing a bit more about me personally and what info they're seeing. And of course, the common question becomes, why not SAML? SAML is basically exploit central. Um, most serious authentication developers should not or will not recommend SAML. And the reason is that it, the way that it does cryptography uh, involves XML parsing, and XML parsing is full of traps. And there are now actually libraries out there for many popular ecosystems which are not maintained with active um, exploits in them, and no patches will ever be published again for them. So if you ever have a choice, do not use SAML. Move to OI, OAuth2 and OIDC as soon as possible. Um, because SAML is increasingly becoming uh, a legacy and you know risky integration for applications. And many of the things that people liked about SAML can now be taken over by something like IDC. So at this point, I have decided that upon this fine, lovely, rainy evening, that I will tempt the fates and perform a live demonstration. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what it looks like for onboarding a user. So on a separate um, uh, tab, what I've done is I've, I'm creating a reset, uh, a, pad, a credential reset link. So here you, you can go to the reset. Um, you can also add as a query parameter. You can, um, with, with the token, there's a QR code generated. I'm not going to show that. But we can enter in our reset token here. So for example, you could post it to someone written down on a piece of paper um, and they can enter it in. It's, a, it's I think it's 120 something bits of security. So it's um, you shouldn't be able to brute force it. Don't try and access this. It's not publicly on the internet. So good luck if you want to try and use it. Um, but the idea is that these tokens should be very hard to brute force. They are time limited um, and you don't need to put in your username. It, the token itself encodes um, and relates to who you, the user, are. So now we can um, set up our new Labs 2022 user. So we can see that we have pass keys, which are the preferred um, form of authentication, and we can also optionally enroll password and TOTP. 
So if we were to enroll something like password or TOTP, um, and we were to enter a weak password, and we submit that, you can see that we get good feedback about the fact that it's short, um, we can add some more letters to make it longer, and we get more information. We're going to improve the formatting of some of these errors, but we're using the ZXCVBN library, which uh, combined with a bad list um, of the top, uh, I think it's 100,000 or 200,000 most compromised passwords um, to deny passwords that, that shouldn't be you know, used. So if I enter uh, a, a good password now, Have to make something up random, but also like have to type it twice. So we can see now that we've set up our, our password and we can see the MFA is disabled. We can now actually start to set up our TOTP as well. So we do all the right things in terms of providing um, the QR code that you can scan with your authenticator application. Um, you can alternately enter the code details manually. You can see that we're using SHA-256 instead of SHA-1. So if we actually use SHA-1 as the hash is said, it's not the worst thing, but if we enter that in and submit, you should see we actually get a warning that says your authenticator is implemented in a way that uses SHA-1 and it's not respecting the requirement of the um, authentication server that we asked for this cryptographic standard. Are you sure you want to proceed? We can also enter the wrong code, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And again, we'll get the incorrect TOTP. But of course, if we enter the correct code, accept, we've now got MFA enabled properly in our account. But that's not really what we want. We want to actually see the pass keys. So here we're going to create our new pass key and we get our options. So if we have a, uh, an iPhone or an Android, you can scan this QR code and it will do uh, Bluetooth to your machine and it can then use your phone's platform authenticator on the website. In the future, this is where policy will come in where you may be able to disable that because of um, some of the, the details around that. Alternately, we can use this laptop's built-in touch ID because I'm on a Mac or you can use a USB security key, which is what I'm going to do here. So I touch the key and it won't complete until I've touched it. So you, you probably saw my arm reaching over the screen. Um, yep, I can see that. Um, and we submit that. So we can now see that we've enrolled our device. And that's much uh, far, far more painless than, than TOTP and password. Um, it's a much more smooth enrollment process compared to trying to set up the TOTP and scanning everything. So we've saved this and we've now onboarded our new user. So let's log in. We can see that we can we have a choice of using the TOTP and password or the pass key. We'll select the pass key. I've touched my device into the pin. I touch the device again and we've now logged in. This data is largely a um, placeholder at this point, but you can see that you know, we can now inspect data about ourselves and we can see who we are. So now let's show you some of the integration um, with uh, OAuth and OIDC. So we've now logged in um, to our, uh, we have an active session. So let's go to another app. So I have a light bulb controller that I wrote for myself. Um, it's quite a bit, it's quite janky, but it works and it does OAuth. And we can see here, we get access denied. And this is because at the moment, this user does not have those permissions. CunnyDM has said, yep, you've got a valid all session, but you have not yet been given the rights to view my light bulbs. And it also gives you this um, operation ID, which very similar to, to other applications with Ray IDs and things like that. If you send this UUID to the administrator, they can find the exact set of log messages which relate to this operation and they can precisely diagnose the error. So this makes it really fantastic for both the user and the admin to actually diagnose and manage issues. And in fact, these UUIDs are always shown on every operation so that um, uh, you can always find them. So let's um, change this. And in the background, again, I'm going to now add um, the user to the group which is allowed to access the light bulbs and I'm going to reconnect to that page. 
So at this point, you can see we've now been asked to consent to proceed. This is pretty common in OAuth, is that the first time you access a site, you are asked if you want to proceed and what the site is. And we can see that it says the site will not have access to your personal information. And that if this site requests that information in the future, we will check with you. So this means that you know, the site currently, all it gets is um, your username and that's it. Um, actually, I don't think it gets the username, to be honest. Um, I need to double check that. But things like your email, like names, all of that will not be sent. So we proceed and we've now been redirected to my light bulb controller, which is also hooked into my environment and temperature sensor. So we can see that right now outside, it's a uh, 20.3 degrees and here inside my office it is 23.9. The humidity is probably gone a bit. Um, we can see that outside, because it's raining, it's nearly 90% humid or 85.9 in my office. You can see here it's 66, but I don't really care about that. So let's um, sign out. Oops, I've got to do that sign out in a second. So now what we're going to do is we're going to change the permissions for that user. We're going to change some of its OAuth permissions. Um, and so what we're going to do is I've now made that change in the background. We're going to go back to it and I'm going to sign out and log back in. And as you can see, the moment the log back in has begun, we get a new consent to proceed dialogue because the details have changed. The site is now asking for more information. We can see that the site is now asking to see my email and whether the email has been verified. And again, if this changes again in the future, we'll be reprompted to proceed. So again, this is putting control for you, the user, if you don't want to proceed. We click proceed, and once again, we're back here. So that's the current demonstration of some of the, the new improvements with Cunny. I, I'm, honestly, I'm not a web developer. I know that it's not all very pretty, but it works, and I'm very happy with that. Um, and you know, we have a lot going on, and there's been so many other changes. 2023 uh, goals. Uh, we want to finish up replication. We really want to get that working. We want to improve account policy, which states whether people can or can't, you know, that enforces multi-factor or that, you know, completely prevents passwords and TOTP as fishable credentials from existing at all. And even things like cryptographic um, and limitations on which devices can be used um, with, with pass keys. The major issue there being that uh, for something like a pass key, uh, on your phone where you've scanned that QR code, that is technically back to a third party auth provider via your Apple account, which may violate some standards. So as a result, we can have policy which states, well, you can only use a Yubi key or a solo key or, or um, very specific hardware models of authenticators. And the final one is that we wanna do a number of improvements to access controls to improve the flexibility of what can be expressed but also to improve their performance um, as they're currently one of the, the major barriers to improving performance again past what we have already. So um, my name is William Brown. I uh, Again, thank you for coming to this talk. My email again is wbrown.suza.de. Um, and I really want to thank you for coming along. And I also really want to thank uh, uh, Yaleman for being the right claw of the uh, Cunny project. They've been a fantastic help with, with the project. I want to thank my manager, uh, Jim, for his continuing support and uh, Tamo Apex from SUSE for also believing in me and encouraging me along with the project and giving me lots of really good advice and ideas. So thank you all very much. And I hope this has been informative and interesting. So if you have any questions, now's the time. And if there aren't any questions, then that's fantastic for me because I get to have an early night. Using center collection betrayment. So um, David has just asked a question in chat, which is, was I using center collections B-tree map before changing to the hash map? No. Both of those libraries were coming from the crate called Concrete, which I created because the B-tree map in the standard library is for single-threaded mutability only. 
Concrete is a transactional and copy on write B plus tree, which is a different data structure. And so we were using the B plus tree from that library before and then added the hash tree um, into that library after, again, as the concurrently readable transactional and, and um, uh, system. Oh, yeah. So the SIMD optimization could definitely be used within B-Tree Map in um, the standard library. I think it would not benefit quite as much because you generally want... Um, so I was using quite large nodes. I think I was using 64-byte nodes. So we're having seven... K so uh, one byte for meta... What was it? Eight bytes for metadata. No, sorry. One byte metadata, seven bytes for keys. Math is, is too late. Math is hard. Seven keys, eight pointers, one bit of metadata. I was ignoring the metadata, but it was still included in the SIMD lookups, and then just ignoring whether that bit field was set in the bit mask, but then the seven keys were actually, we did the compare with that on the SIMD lanes. Um, and of course, the SIMD, the, the items were U64s. So you can do that, and I was using the standard SIMD um, crate um, before I, I don't know if it's merged, it was packed simmed, but uh, I think the standard library B tree, however, instead of using seven keys, four pointers, I think it's three keys, four pointers, um, which means that I think that simmed may not be quite as efficient. Um, saying this, you would gain access to, what is it? Uh, specialization, which is the ability to implement a trait for a specific subtype over a generic, which is something that we lacked in concrete, thus necessitating a completely different type which was quite a pain, but yes. No problem, happy to help, David. Um, Shung Kusi Yu, I'm sorry, I probably just said your name incorrectly. Um, he, Shung has just asked, uh, with eventual consistent replication, revoking access may take some time to propagate. So this is absolutely a really good question to ask um, because, you know, the unfortunate reality of our world is that we do need to sometimes remove people's access and, you know, um, and I got their name correct. I'm very, very, very glad. Um, we do need to remove people's access and depending on the situation that may or may not be in friendly circumstances. Um, five minutes. Okay. Um, and so, you know, accounting for replication delay is a thing. Um, so generally the way that most systems do this is they you know there are multiple different ways so something like free ipa or 389 they don't really take this into account they effectively rely on replication just being very quick um, systems like active active directory can trigger a replicate now event which tells all servers replicate immediately and they can prioritize password change events over other events to be replicated so they will always get them first even if other changes exist to speed that up but generally when you are doing a access control revocation um you know the, the reality of how that's done in a business is you know you know and having been at a sysad sysadmin before and having actually seen it happen is that generally the manager will take you out for lunch and while you're out Everyone will make sure that all your access is revoked. They'll reset all the shared passwords. And then the manager will say, all right, you're fired, never come back. And then you'll be sent a box with your stuff in the office. So, uh, so uh, and so, yeah, part of it is about physical security and removing someone's access and about policy. Um, if someone is a remote worker, you know, there are other legal ramifications when it's something like an online, so, you know, you want to revoke access to someone's website. So say like a, you know, we, we want to revoke access to someone's GitHub or something like that. You know, there's always going to be a bit of delay. So the main thing is not about making it instantaneous, but about minimizing that as much as possible. And that's where having an effective replication system, um, as well as monitoring that you all the replication changes have gone out, is going to be so important to make sure that revocations um, work and are timely. So yes, that is something that I have absolutely been thinking about because that is such a big and important part of identity that we often don't talk about is that sometimes we have to take someone's access away. Um, and so that is an important 
a very important consideration. So thank you for the question. I think we've got a couple of minutes, maybe one or two more minutes. So if there's any last questions, maybe in the next 30 seconds would be great. Otherwise I might call it that. All right, well, thank you everyone for taking time uh, to watch this and to participate and ask questions. I uh, really appreciate it, and I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of the conference. I've not been able to watch too many talks myself yet, but I've read the, the papers and I have a watch list for me for after this, and so I want to thank everyone else who has been a speaker at this event um, for all of their work to, to make it a success. So thank you all very much, and I hope you have a great day.